Um, and then I followed, I was like trying to do Anki and it's just a little like awkward for me. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I know some people like swear by it. Like I tried to force myself to do it, so I'll still do it. But like you're 90 cards, like sometimes it kills me, like 90. I know. Um, you can also reduce it. Like if you're like, realistically, I'm never going to do 90. If you make your limit 40 every day, like you don't have to follow like that many, like seeing half the cards is better than seeing no, none of the cards. It took me till term three to actually feel comfortable with Anki and actually start using it regularly. So okay. I try and force it on you guys early because it does help, but mm -hmm. it's not, I wasn't able to get the swing of it until term three until I really started using it. And once I really got good at it, it helped me immensely, but there's a big learning curve to it. And that's why I push you guys to do it early. But if doing 90 is too much, don't cut it out all the way. Try and keep using it um, and push yourself with that because there will come a point where you'll really need it. Mm -hmm. Not as much right now, but getting comfortable with it now is like helpful in the long run. Okay. So it was kind of like um, with the last FTM2, I just had like um, kind of like a, the oh shit moment like I'm not learning anything I'm just like passively reading all these slides and like I'm not applying anything I can't answer any of the questions um so I'm just and then like I, I just don't know what to do yeah <laughs> to be completely honest you. with you <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things you'll probably need to do is start doing more questions because it is great if you learn everything well enough that you can sit down and you can answer all the questions right but the amount of time it takes Okay. To learn everything well enough to answer the questions is almost impossible. Like you simply don't have enough time okay. to learn it all really properly and then start doing questions and then do well in the questions. It's not going to happen. Um, especially with MSK because you need to start doing questions like right away. Okay. So what you have to get really used to is doing poorly on questions and using them as a learning tool instead of a testing tool because those questions that you get wrong will likely show up on your exam very similar questions they only ask the same 20 things about the rest and they only ask the same 100 things about the back or whatever number it is there's only so many things to ask a level one medical student so doing those questions every day is going to solidify the most important information even if you can't answer them right you want to memorize those questions like you do a lecture if that makes sense okay. so yeah questions earlier will help you another thing i'm bad at i don't like doing questions until i learn everything <laughs> um so i'm i'm telling you about my mistake because i term one like everyone was telling me to do, do this and everyone was telling me to do that and i am stubborn and i did none of it and i barely scraped by by the skin of my teeth and then term two, I was like, really? all right, maybe I'll start listening to these people. And then okay. I started doing more questions and trying to do Anki, which I still wasn't able to do yet. Um, and I was able <laughs> to boost up a little bit more. And I didn't really start doing well at SGU until term four. Okay. Like before, before that, I was like dead average constantly. My first high B at SGU was term four. So okay. what I've tried to do is kind of skip those two terms of learning for you guys and just tell you what works and everybody's different but that's what my schedules are based on they're based on wow i finally started listening to people and i finally started doing the things that work for everybody and when i actually listen and i stop being so stubborn because i'm really bad at that it does help not yeah. everybody's still different like some things are still going to help you more than others or vice versa um but that's just kind of my, been my experience like i did not do great. Uh, MSK was also my worst subject. It was my lowest grade at SGU. It was MSK. So uh, I get how hard it is. I'm not some brainiac who's just like super good at school. Like okay. I just finally figured out what worked for me, basically. So unfortunately, they ask things about their lectures. Mm -hmm. And that's why, like, one of the things I have is like, oh, make sure you get a second pass on all the lectures, like on the weekend, like review these four, review these four. Um, mm -hmm. And why a lot of the Anki cards are based on the lectures because it sucks, but they don't only ask the things. I mean, obviously there were questions you could get right from those videos and stuff like that, but it, 
it's not going to be enough. Now for step, it'll be enough. Really? Okay. It really, really, and that's one of the reasons too I make you guys do all these videos is because like, I think I made you watch the cystic fibrosis video. It is leaps yeah. and bounds above what you need to know about cystic fibrosis right now. But you're going to watch it every single term because there will be questions about cystic fibrosis, term one, term two, term three, term four, term five. And by yeah. the time you get into dedicated, you are going to get every single cystic fibrosis question, right? Because you've seen that video now at least 10 times because you watched at least twice every term. So it's a little bit forward thinking. And that's really hard when you're trying to just scrape by by the skin of your teeth right now. And yeah. that's why I don't give you the guys the picturizes for everything or the videos for everything. I'm like, this one's high yield. Watch this one. Don't bother with these ones because okay. you need to know it all eventually. But while you're trying to pass right now, lectures are most important. When you're in the passing stage and trying to get by, all those videos are great, but they're to excel throughout these five years. And if you are trying to get just by right now, you need to be lectures and questions. Okay. And then I got your first aid book. Like I just got it a few days ago. I was like, let me just. Not my out. first aid book. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? But like, you're like, you have to get the first aid. You do. So, I mean, it makes everything a little simpler. Um, there's obviously stuff that's not on the slides. Obviously. And vice but versa. It, there's stuff on the slides that I wasn't in here. Yeah. So, but it's just a little bit nicer to get a second, like, look over. But how hard are you at memorizing that? Are you, like, memorizing it, like, tight? Or are you just skimming it while you're skimming lectures? Or So, it kind of depends, right? So, like, if you have something about, I think you brachial have something. Plexus about the brachial plexus right so the brachial plexus every single thing in first aid on the brachial plexus is the highest yield things about the brachial plexus that you will be asked you will oh, okay it doesn't have everything that you could be asked but it has all the most important ones so when it comes okay. to things like that every anki card is based off this first aid book so if you do the brachial plexus cards you will have memorized the first aid in theory, um, if you do it correctly. Um, but memorizing that stuff is going to super, super help you, help you. Now, I think you guys, whenever like Charcot Marie foot disease or whatever, you don't need to memorize the first aid for that. They just mentioned it as a clinical correlative. You're going to learn more about that in neuro. That's not, so the first aid thing is, is split up by sections and you're in the physio part of your med school career. So anytime, so if you flip to, let's go to MSK, you have the 2020 version? Yeah. Okay, so go to 460 or whatever. And I would take you out to Bruce Chris right now if I could. <laughs> this is like the nicest thing anyone's ever done for me. I no, swear. people, listen, you guys being on, the, not being on the island, you miss a lot of human interaction. But I had so many upper termers like sit down with me and show me how to study. And that's, how I learned everything. So the fact that you guys don't have that, I'm trying to reach out because if I show you, you can show other people and and move it on. Yeah, so if you, you look at 458, 459, 460, mm -hmm. look at the headings. You see how it says musculoskeletal skin and connective tissue, anatomy and physiology, and then it switches Correct. to pathology. No, so you're in, you haven't learned path yet. Path is a fourth year thing. Like for a fourth term thing, right? So anything in the path section, I'm not worried about memorizing because they might mention it to you. They might want you to be a little bit comfortable with it, but I'm not memorizing it. Okay. Anything in the physio section, you are not going to learn again. This is the one and only time SGU is going to teach you the physio in MSK before you go into dedicated and learn it for studying your step. So anything in that physio section, is fair game to memorize, to learn, to completely understand. So don't learn the pathology essentially yet. Exactly. So if okay. you, if you know, I assign pages every day for like what to read or whatever like that, sometimes I'll assign a path one. That's not to memorize, that's just to look at. Like, oh look, here's Charcot Marie Tooth, like this is why you need to learn it, it's in the neuro section, like just look at it, kind of get a touch of it, just so you know what they're talking about, but don't memorize it. But when you okay. get to the brachial plexus page, on 448, where it talks about herbs, palsy, and clumsies, and thoracic 
you will be asked about all those things. It just, it seems, um, it seems awkward because like, I have that guy that just says write good a thousand times. Uh, who's that professor? He says write good 2000 million times. Oh, Deepak Sharma. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. Like I just, but so he you doesn't... can't just memorize this, right? Cause that's not how like MSK works, but or, yeah. you want to learn the MSK. What you want to make sure is that at the end of learning about the axillary nerve, when you finish all the questions on the axillary nerve and you've looked at videos of the axillary nerve and you understand how it works, can I look and say, yes, it causes a flattened deltoid, loss of arm abduction and loss of sensation. Does all of that make sense? Yes. Okay. And the causes are surgical neck fractures and anterior dislocation. Can I answer those things? It shouldn't be like, I'm just going to memorize this. You have to understand it first, but this is what you want to make sure you know. So it's a study Chris. guide. Okay. If that makes um, sense. Yeah, no, that that's way better. I was like hard memorizing this last night, like with like a. Well, my I hand. mean, like some people with a photographic memory could totally do that. What I tried to do for MSK was make about ten million flashcards. Didn't go so well. Um, so what you want to do is you, when you do the, I forget what chapter in grades they assigned for arm stuff, but you want to leave this page open. And every time you do a question and the answer is axillary nerve, flip to this axillary nerve section and say, oh, wow, that was an anterior dislocation of the humerus. And oh, wow, they mentioned the flat, flattened deltoid. Okay, or maybe they, it, it was a third cause, right? That third cause in here so that this becomes your study guide for what you need to remember causes those things. Oh, okay. So you're saying kind of even have them open together right and just hit them together. Exactly. Because the sixth question you see with a flattened deltoid, you're going to be like, oh, flattened deltoid, axillary, <laughs> axillary, easy. None of these other ones cause that. I wouldn't have even realized that if it wasn't for moving back and forth between those. So those grazed questions are, are really the most important part of MSK because they... Yeah. They teach you what you need to know. You don't need to know everything about the axillary nerve. Knowing that it goes from here to here to here to here and this part of the branch and this part of the chain, and that, that's all great. But if you can't look at a patient and say, wow, your deltoid is flat, let's see if your arm is dislocated, then there's no point in you learning this because they want you to be a doctor with this stuff. Sure. So, so you're saying kind of the grades is like the gold standard, even if you don't yes. really know the material on the slides yet, hit the grays right away day one because you're still going to have to learn the stuff on the slides mm -hmm. but now when you're looking at the slides again you're like oh man they do have a whole section on the flattened deltoid i didn't even pay attention to that would you pull up the slides if you get the question wrong like right absolutely. away absolutely okay. absolutely do it all at the same time as opposed to like i have to learn the material and then i have to do questions okay like if you do it okay. together, it's going to solidify things way more. Now, so are you hitting, oh, go ahead. sorry, are you hitting a pass on your, your notes first and then you're going to do it? Or I would, gonna... I would watch the lecture on two times speed or one time speed, watch it under, get an idea and then do a bunch of questions on it. So I'm okay. only doing one pass. I'm not worried about memorizing it yet. I'll memorize it as I practice it. So you're, you're pulling up the lecture, rewatching the lecture again. So you're doing two lecture. No, no. I mean, if you watch it the initial time, that's fine. Okay. Like if you watched it live or whatever, I don't know how you guys are distance learning it. I didn't, I went to class and just like listened to it. Oh, okay. And then that was, and then you were good with that and then you do questions on that? Yeah. Oh, so you wouldn't pass over this for like four hours? Never. Never. I mean, I would, and that's why I didn't do well. But once I started doing well on things, you never spend more than an hour on a lecture first pass. You won't, you won't have enough time in your life. So even, oh yeah, cause I'm doing like 12, 13, 14, 15 hours a day. Which is possible if you're doing everything, but it should be about an hour on a lecture. First so, pass. So you're saying first pass, like in the morning, so I have my, my classes at 7 a.m. Right. So that is my pass. And then I should just start doing questions right, right now, like now. Wow, Absolutely. that just seems so different. It seems crazy, and it's definitely not how I studied in undergrad. It's definitely not how you studied in undergrad. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, but I promise you, there is not a single person in the world who does not get better when they do more questions. 
Like I have, okay. there are people who really learn well from picture eyes. There's people who don't. There's people who really like first aid and there's people who don't. There is nobody who does not benefit from extra questions because that's what your exam is. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that compares to it. That's how we study for dedicated. That's how we study for every term. So they're not going to ask you the exact same questions on grade, uh, the grace questions. You know, it's not going to be like the same 14 year old fell on an outstretched hand mm -hmm. and the exact same presentation, but they're always going to be really similar. There's only so many ways you can break something. There's only so many things that get damaged and they're not looking for the, for the weird obscure. They're looking for the ones that they want you to know. Okay. So you're getting that second pass with the questions out and then you're going to the slide, like slide 13 has this on. Okay. That's just so different. It's a lot of control up. F, a lot of control F like, Oh, the deltoid thing. I am going to keep going back to that. Cause just cause it's an example here. Like I'm just going to search my lecture for the word deltoid. Let me see what innervates it. Let me see what does the sensory for it. Let me see what does the motor for it. And let me really put that into my brain. So you're making it more active instead of like, okay, so like this is what I do. I get home or whatever. And then I like study the slides for like two hours. And then I do questions, but I like it. it there's a disconnect somewhere. So yeah, it's just better use of your time. You're going to remember more. You, there are definitely people and you can spend it. I know lots of people who get 10 passes on the slides. They'll just do quick over and over and over again. Every day they'll just flip through all of them and that works for them. But you're to really try it and you're gonna remember that slide way more when you got three questions wrong on it and you keep on going back to that same slide. And then you can kind of see like what they're testing on and what's important, okay. Exactly. Wow, that is, I'm sorry to say that was badass. Okay, <laughs> Like, it's crazy, but I promise you it will work. So you're saying like, example and, today, mm -hmm. and I'm sorry if I keep sounding stupid, but like clinical, so like we had clinical anatomy of elbow and forearm, thousand million things are taught, a thousand. You're saying just start hitting questions and then have your first aid, have this, have this up and just like, oh crap. And you I have that know. Atlas book too with all the pictures. You can open that yeah. too. Like when I did this stuff, I literally had like my whole bed covered in, I didn't have a desk. So my whole bed covered in the books open and I'm looking at those things. Cause your oh whole thing gosh. is you're trying to learn how to answer the questions, right? Yeah. Like unless you want to be an orthopedic surgeon. And even if you do, no. the only thing you need to be able to do is answer the questions. Okay. So learn how to do go. that. Even if you get every single Gray's question wrong, it's not to test you, it's to teach you. That is correct. Okay, that's crazy. <laughs> I'm not so, true like, with I'll all do subjects, it. but it's yeah, more yeah, yeah. true with anatomy than anything else. Because you can study those slides for days, memorize everything, and still not be able to answer a question when it comes 100%, to 100%. That's me. And, and then, then you're, and you... you're frustrated because by that point, you should be able to answer the questions, but you can't. So now you're just pissed, as opposed to like opening and being like, I'm not supposed to get any of these right, I'm just learning. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, sorry. I'm just like awkwardly like I'm like kind of scared, but like it's okay. <laughs> All right, like, so let's you know, try like... it. Do you have your grace? Okay. Do you have your grace book? Yeah, got it. Okay, so flip to your whatever your first assigned question is for for, for the subject or whatever, and we're literally just gonna pull up your slides and we're gonna we're gonna do it together. Okay. Did you want to do like the recording thing and like hook people so up? Actually, or? believe it or not, I've been recording us this, this whole time. Uh, okay. you'll, you're going to get to decide what parts I post and what parts I don't. No, go whatever. for it. Go for it. Um, but I just set it up to record the whole thing. So. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. As long as maybe you just don't put my score, then everything <laughs> else is fair game. You can have the dinner thing. I don't care. Let me pull up the, um, the we'll, we'll, we'll slice it in and out. It's fine. Because <laughs> I think other people would benefit from hearing about how to study and how to do grades questions, right? I couldn't agree more, unfortunately. It's but I can't sit down with sure. all 1,400 of you, so. I know, and I was like, oh my God, she wrote me back, Mother Nature. <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited. It's like I, more so than like if I got picked in The Bachelor. <laughs> yeah, I was like so excited. Med school okay. Bachelor. So, so let's, uh, you want me to share, can I share a screen with you? Please. Okay, Let cool. me give you permission. I think you have it, but security allow participant. Okay, you can share a screen now. Perfect. 
Let me just do, I think this will work. Do you see this one? Yes, I do. Okay. So you can literally so, make any question and we'll just see, do it. Okay. You want to hit these ones? Um, I don't know. Questions 13 through 17. Is the lectures. Know. Yes, that's arm stuff. So let's see like fit question 56 there. Let's just do question 56. Pull it up and let's see what. Okay. Oh, do we have an e-copy or do we have? Um, you do have an e-copy, but you have to sign up for it. If you have the paper one, you can just read it out loud. I don't have, me, I have the book somewhere, but I don't even know. It's been let me just text it. Do you want me to text it to you? Yeah, that'd be perfect. Just send me a picture. Okay, cool. On Facebook or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, 50, chapter six. We're going to do 52. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Six, two, eighty-seven. There's no like, sorry, there's no chapter name, so it's like so hard to. No, you're good. Find two. Eight. You're on the question book one, right? Because um, there's two grades books. There's one question book, and there's one like anatomy book. So it's the smaller one. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. I have the smaller one. Okay, so question fifty-six. On chapter I was, like, doing six. Yeah. Cool. I was like doing those um, ones in the beginning. I was like, I'm so good at this. And then it says like first order question. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but that's good. You want to start with the easy ones. That's one too. I'm going to send you a few. You want me to send you 56, 58? Yeah, send me a couple. I'm bad in anatomy, so we'll see how much of this I remember. I don't think you're bad at anything. I think it's all. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Definitely bad in anatomy. <laughs> okay. I promise. Let me see. Okay, got you. I sent you four of them. Perfect. Or like four pictures, but I think it's only three questions. Perfect. You sent them on Facebook? Yeah. Okay. They're just come. They're taking their sweet time. Sorry, I'm on like a hot spot. No, oh, you're good. There we go. Okay. So, fifty-six. You said, or I yeah. said? Okay. So a 61-year-old man, so we're looking at an adult, was hit in the mid-humeral region of his left arm by a cricket bat. So we're talking about upper arm. Physical examination reveals an inability to extend the wrist and loss of sensation on a small area of the skin of the dorsum of the hand proximal to the first two fingers. What nerve supplies this region of the hand, right? So the first thing we want to do is summarize. Let's see. I think I can type on this thing. Uh, do you want, do you want me to stop sharing screen? No, you should be fine. Okay. I just want to annotate, and I forget how to do that. Annotate. Here we go. So I can literally type right here. So the first thing, can you see what I'm writing? Mm, no. Let me... Okay. So the first, I'm going to write a couple things, and I'll show you. It's just because okay. I haven't typed it yet. So. Okay. First thing we want to do is what was damaged, mid-humeral, right? Mm -hmm. Then we have some motor deficits. So what are the motor issues he's having? Um, uh, inability to extend the wrist and loss of sensation. So extend wrist. On the dorsum of the hands. And so our sensory is dorsum of hands. So now okay. can you see what I wrote? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so you have location. Um, Mid-humerus, motor, oh, okay. extending the wrist, and sensory dorsum of the hand. Because between all of those words, those are the things that we're supposed to get, right? Okay. So we could kind of answer this question three ways. We could know what gets damaged in a mid-humeral fracture. We could know what does the motor to wrist extension. Or we could know the sensory to the dorsum of the hand. Any of those things could answer the question. Okay. So now pull up your lecture on the brachial plexus or on the hand or the wrist, and let's see well, if I'm we gonna... can find a slide on that. Let me see if I can edit the screen share so I can do like my whole screen. Um, and then yeah, I can you should be up. able to. Cool. 
Um, cool. Can you see this? Yes. Okay, yes. cool. Is that the slide? Um, no, 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 I wish. <laughs> <laughs> um, the ability to extend the wrist, so we want to break it down from... So we want to find, unless you know what extends the wrist, you, we want to find where in your, in your lecture has wrist extension and um, flexion. And uh, so wrist extension. Yeah. See if we can find it. And if not, we'll go to, ah, oh, here we go. Let me zoom out just a little bit. Perfect. Okay. So these are the muscles, right? Correct. So um, flexes and abducts the wrist is the flexor carpi radialis, but we're looking for extending the wrist, right? Mm -hmm. So do we see that here? We don't see that. So then okay. it would be a different compartment. Exactly. Um, flexes the wrist. Okay, so we're still looking for extending the wrist. So it's probably extending in the, the posterior wrist. compartment. I know that. So you can scroll to, until you get to the posterior compartment. There we go. All this fun. Okay, cool. Okay, so the name of the muscle makes a lot of sense. Extensor. Carpi. Okay. Carpi is the wrist. And ulnaris mm -hmm. is just the, the side, the nerve or whatever. So the posterior interosseous nerve is the thing that extends the wrist. Okay. Now, if you look at that question again, is posterior inter interosseous an answer? It's probably not. Posterior interosseous is, a, is an answer. It is. Okay. So that would probably then be the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so now check and see if that's the answer. I'll be honest, this like scares me. <laughs> this is like, this is so not how it, how you think how it, it should, should be. be. Yeah. Yeah. What questions at 56? Um, 56, A, we have, what is this? In upper limb, we have, A, so the patient suffered injury to the radial nerve in the mid-humeral region. Okay, perfect. So now go to 447. On um, first aid? Yep. And we're going to look at the radial section. Okay. So the first thing we want to do is we now know that the posterior interosseous nerve is a branch of the radial. So underneath the radial, I would put posterior interosseous nerve in, in pen. Posterior interosseous nerve. Oh, that's because you pulled it on the slides? Yes. Cool. Okay, so posterior. interosseous nerve. Okay. So radial nerve also could have been an answer. Okay, so the first thing here on radial is the different causes. There's three. One, two, three. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to number them. So number one is compression. Number two is mid-shaft. And number three is repetitive. So read me uh -huh. all three of those. So compression of the uh, axilla um, due to uh, crutches or sleeping with arm over chair, Saturday night palsy. Um, Mid-shift fracture of the humerus, repetitive pronation, supination of the forearm due to screwdriver use. Okay, so did our patient in 56 have one of those three causes? Um, let's see, compression of the axillate, no. Um, Mid-shift fracture. Physical examination shows inability to extend the wrist. Um, so the mid-shaft fracture, what did our patient have? Mid-humeral region, so yes. Right, so he had the mid-shaft fracture of the humerus. Okay, so we have okay. one of those three. So I can check off that. Okay, yeah, that matches. So I could have known radial, interosseous, and just known that that was one of the three causes, right? Okay. Okay, but now let's look at the symptoms. So the very first thing it has under presentation is wrist drop. So wrist drop is when your wrist, if you, can you see my hand? Correct. So yeah. your wrist is supposed to be able to flex and extend. If you can't okay. extend, it drops. Okay. So wrist drop is a loss of extension. Okay. So it says wrist drop, loss of elbow, wrist, and finger extension. So now what I'm realizing is that the radial nerve, it doesn't just do wrist extension. It also does elbow extension 
and finger extension. So now I can make this assumption that the radial nerve does all extension of the arm. And anytime they're asking me about extension, I know the answer is going to be radial. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> and I'm making those leaps because I know that to be true. And I'm helping you guiding that. But can you go to the find a slide on the radial nerve? It might be in the brachial plexus lecture. So just to, I don't know, we already said this, but here, let me just do that's radial head. Here, I'm just going to go to um, all nodes, radio. Sometimes searching is really frustrating and difficult. As you get more comfortable with the lectures, you'll, you know, but there should be a section on the, so there's the, no, no, no. Is it shoulder anatomy? Um, yeah, let's do that one. That one might have the brachial plexus in it. I haven't oh, seen these okay. lectures in, in ages. Posterior extensor compartment. Radial okay, nerve. so radial nerve. So we've already learned that the radial nerve does all the extensions and it's also in the posterior compartment, which makes sense because if you're looking at my arm again, mm -hmm. remember that nerves are basically levers or muscles mm -hmm. are, right? So if I'm in the back, this posterior compartment, and I pull a lever, that's extension. That's extending my wrist. If I'm in the anterior compartment and I pull that lever, that's flexion. So okay. anything in the anterior compartment will always do flexion with the arm and anything in the posterior will always do, based on leverage, will do the extension. Okay. And the same thing happens with my wrist, must be anterior to do that flexion. Oh, okay. Okay, wow. so let's keep going. I know it's a lot, but as you see, there's how many nerves here in the brachial plexus? One, two, three, four, five, six. So if we can get down radial nerve, in this 10 minute kind of session where we're talking about it, and then you can answer all the radial nerve questions, right? Now you only have five other ones to master, right? So extension of forearm, radial nerve, tricep. Okay, so now I'm learning that one of the things that the radial nerve does is the tricep. Is the tricep. Does that make sense? Where is your tricep? Is it in the front or the back of your arm? So it'd be in the posterior? It's posterior, and we already said that the radial nerve was posterior, so that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Oh, loss of sensation over posterior arm, forearm, and dorsal hand. Exactly. Okay. This is so just different, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I keep saying No, it. you're good. Um, deep brachial runs posterior to humerus and radial groove. Okay, so no. now we're talking about this thing called, no, this is perfect. Okay. So we're talking about the blood supply that matches the radial nerve. So the radial nerve runs in the radial groove of the humerus, which makes it your mid shaft. Okay. And what it runs with is this deep brachial artery. Okay. Okay. So what they said, hey, look, the radial groove, the mid shaft was fractured. The radial nerve was damaged what blood vessel may have been damaged with it? Deep brachial. So where, so if you look, um, so where I numbered in first aid, 447, four, I said seven. mid shaft fracture of the humerus was number two. Mm -hmm. You could put right next to that with brachial artery in um, radial groove. Because now I'm Great learning line. that those things go together. And I'm I'm helping you a lot here. Like, I wouldn't expect you to know to write that down. But <laughs> I'm teaching you what's important. Okay. No, thank you. I, I appreciate <laughs> it. Um, okay. So let's so you're tying in nerve. everything. But you're tying in everything you see related to the radial nerve. Exactly. Because if I'm, and I'm not like really going crazy with it. Most of the stuff is already in the first aid. I'm just connecting it. Okay. So loss of sensation over posterior arm and dorsum of the hand, right? Okay, so do me a favor and look down at the pictures at the bottom of the first aid page. Okay. Find anything that says radial. Look at the first picture, find the radial nerve, then the second picture, and then the third picture. Okay. So in the first picture, we see the radial nerve coming off the brachial plexus up by the armpit, right? By the axilla. Mm hmm Okay, and then it comes down and you see radial nerve in spiral groove. Yep. Okay, and we just learned the deep brachial artery runs with that. 
And then we come down and we can see the radial nerve coming down into the forearm. And then we kind of, we kind of lose it there. Okay. But okay. we can see that where do they point out the radial nerve is near the axilla, then it goes into the radial groove and then it comes into the forearm. Now we come to the um, sensation part. So where is the radial nerve here? So the radial nerve is in the, it's, you mean the sensation, that second picture? Yes. yes. So in the, in the thumb and then in the, um, the outer head of the bicep? Exactly. Okay. And is that on the, are those parts on the kind of more of the back or more of the front? Because where this is a front picture, but you can kind of see it stretching around the back. So, so it'd be. If it's radial, it should be mostly the back of the arm. Mostly back the back. Of the thumb, right. And if you look at the dorsum of the hand picture, which is the next picture on the right, you can see how it okay. does that. A lot of oh, the back it wraps of the hand. Around. Okay. Right. This is so active learning, like, what? this is crazy. <laughs> but the thing is, like, by the okay. end of our conversation, I want you to be, like, every radio question you're, like, so comfortable with. You're like, oh, yeah, it's either compression of the axilla. So now let's look back at the, those three causes, right? So compression of the axilla. Go down to that picture where we just saw. Where was the radial nerve? In the axilla. Mm -hmm. Then number two was mid-shaft of the humerus. In that same picture, radial groove in the humerus. And then the last thing is repetitive pronation or supination, which is where is it's affected in that in the forearm. So those three places are also the three places that it's labeled in that picture. Mm -hmm. And then the thing, the sensation on the right, it matches the dorsum of the hand near the thumb. Okay. So okay. then, wow, because that's in every single part of the question too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um that's annoying <laughs> so every question what you want to say is where was it damaged what's the motor deficit what's the sensory deficit and knowing any of those three things can get you the question you don't have to know all three knowing all three is great so damaged what was the motor can you repeat and what that was the sensation motor the sensory and... deficit okay okay so let's do the next question 57. okay Okay, so this time you're going to tell me where it's damaged, what's the motor, what's the sensory. Okay, a 45-year-old woman is admitted to the hospital with neck pain. An MRI examination reveals a herniated disc in the cervical region. Physical examination reveals a weakness in extension or para I can't even, I'm not even going to try. Um, <laughs> on, the, on the back of her arm and forearm. Um, which of the following lower, low, uh, which of the following, sorry, <laughs> spinal nerves is most likely injured? Um, okay, so then, so the, what is damaged is the um, herniated disc in the cervical region. Okay, and what was the motor issue? And then the motor issue is wrist extension and that paresthesia, paris. Which is like tingling. Tingling, okay. So that's your sensory issue. Oh, so that's sensory. So then the wrist extension is the motor. Yes. Right. Okay. So wrist extension is motor and that, that fun word is the sensory. <laughs> Parastasias. Yeah. You're yeah. saying it right. Okay. okay. So you see what I wrote down here? Um, um, oh, it's cool. exactly what you said. Okay. Now, in the last question, what did you learn did extension of the wrist? Radial nerve. Radial nerve. The radial nerve does extension of the wrist, mid shift. Right. Specifically, it was the posterior interosseous nerve, branch of the radial nerve. Uh huh. And what did sensory to the back of the arm and forearm? What did sensory to the back of the arm and forearm post? The radial again, the posterior the radial? interosseous. Okay, okay so okay. the deficits in this person is the same as the last one, but it's a different cause. We're looking at a cervical disc. Okay, so when we're talking about cervical discs, is it damaging a whole nerve or just the roots of the nerve? Is so it just damaging share. the roots? Because they'd have. Yeah. So okay. I'm going to share my screen for a minute. If okay. This will you want me to stop share? Yes. Okay. okay. So we're going to look at a little picture of the brachial plexus spinal nerves. It's great to memorize the brachial plexus like this, but you do need to actually understand what's happening. 
That is yeah. the, the big draw, I think. I, like, I can memorize the picture, but then it's like, question, what the hell? Right. So what we see is, this is the spinal cord. This is a little blurry. And That's there's okay. nerve roots coming off of it. That's how we always start drawing the, drawing the brachial plexus. We start with C5, C6, C7, C8, C9, or T1, right? Mm -hmm. So we know that the outcome is us damaging the radial nerve. Mm -hmm. But we, what they're asking for, since they're talking about cervical, is what supplies the radial nerve? Okay. So, so what are the know, answer like the choices? Origins. Exactly. They're asking the origin of the radial nerve. So in your question, what were the answer choices? I have in my question, I have C5, C6, C7, uh, C8, and T1. Okay. So do you know the roots, the spinal roots of the of the radial nerve? The C5, C6? So it's C5, oh, C5, C1. C, C1, sorry. Okay. And you see that's in the first aid next to the word radial. At the mm -hmm. end of the brachial plexus lecture, they have this little like mnemonic with like five rats and three musketeers and something like that. Did you see that yeah. lecture yet? Um, I don't know if I saw that in the thing, but I just it's saw like this Randy Travis drinks cold beer type thing. And okay, aid. that's a different one. Um, but there's okay. this thing about how to memorize which ones are which roots. So that's worth it. But for right now, one you're going to memorize today is that the radial is C5 to T1. Okay, okay, so you're going to put that on a sticky note. You're going to make a mnemonic for that. Um, I think it's five rats is the mnemonic. How you remember that? I have no idea, but that's... You need to find a way for you to remember it. You can use the okay. one that the lectures gave you. You can come up with your own mnemonic. You can draw an R that looks like a C5, whatever you want to do. But you need to know that the radial nerve is C5 to T1. Because okay. since we knew that there was loss of wrist extension, and there was loss of sensation of the dorsum, we knew it was radial. Now we just have to find out, okay, what the roots are. So both of these questions, we could have answered just from these, this one paragraph in first aid, right? Uh -huh. But we had to know the posterior interosseous was a branch of the radial, and we needed to know that C5 to T1 was the radial nerve. So can I ask you a question? So with 56, so how do you determine like, the posterior interosseous looks so good and it, it fits the category. So you know? practice, but you'll learn that the posterior interosseous is just the last branch of the radial nerve. So we need the whole nerve. Exactly. Okay. The median has the anterior interosseous nerve. So whenever you're looking for the answer median and it doesn't come up, like if there's not a median, the answer is mm -hmm. going to be anterior interosseous. So you know that those mean the, basically the same thing, the <laughs> lecture. Okay. So every one of these has another branch, but like the ulnar one's really easy. I think it's called the recurrent branch of the ulna. So you're like, mm -hmm. well, that one I don't really need to memorize. The weird ones are the two interosseous ones. So those are radial and then, um, what's the other one you said? Anterior interosseous, I believe is median. Don't quote me on median. that, but I'm pretty okay. sure that's the case. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's do another question. So now I like I'm sure that you know wrist extension is radial nerve. Like that's the most yeah. important thing I want you to get out of this. So then the region, you want me to check the answer? Yeah. Okay. So that 57 is C. So then C would be C7. C7 to, what, just says C7? It's just the answers are, are A, C5, B, C6, C, C7, D, C8, and E, T1. So they're I saying know. that would be C7 specifically. Because wouldn't it, wouldn't you rather feel comfortable putting like C5 to T1? Yes. And, okay. and that one is usually C5 to C6, but you have to go with what they see there. So then that's like something you're like, oh, this is annoying. I'll write it down. I'll be like, this is a, a thing that's not in here, but I still knew it was the radial nerve. Which and is then you would just look at the explanation. Yeah, of... absolutely. Like they have explanations for every question. So what does it say? So the seventh cervical nerve makes a major contribution to the radial nerve. And this is the prime mover in wrist extension. The dermatone of C7 is the region described. 
Okay, so that's, there you go. So now you're going to say, all right, well, I'm going to write down, even though that it says radial is C5 to T1, I'm going to circle C7. So I'm going to write down ICO. under radial that not only do I need to know that radial is posterior interosseous, I need to know that the most important part of radial is C7. Correct. Okay, and one of the things we always say is that our middle finger is C7. So if you want to flip the bird to someone, it's C7. I won't even attempt to do that to you. <laughs> but nice. that's a, it's a kind of a thing that if you, you tell a couple of your friends that you're giving them C7, you're going to remember that the middle finger is C7. That's true. So now I know that there's a prime extension, radial nerve. That's annoying. Okay. <laughs> but do you know, now do you know the motor of radial nerve? So wrist extension? What else extension? Um, oh, um, the shoulder. You can oh. read it. You can okay. read it. Sorry, it's just, I hate getting put on the spot. Um, <laughs> That's fine. So radial nerve, we have uh, loss of elbow, wrist, and finger extension. That's okay, the motor. Right. Okay, and what about the sensory? So sensory is loss of sensation. Over posterior then, arm, forearm, and dorsal hand. So all of this is all radial nerve. Okay. The whole and are you thinking? Compartment. And you're thinking about the actual like arm and everything. I'm like, you're just getting more like uh, or active learning with. It. Okay. Exactly. Now I'm gonna teach you a trick that we always remember. So this is just like it works like 99% of the time. So we say if you damage a nerve here, it's A. R M that spells arm, right? So if you damage anything here, it's usually the axillary nerve, which is A. You damage anything here, mid shaft, that's a radial, and damage anything here at that antecubitum, that's medial. That gets to a lot of questions shocking. And I've also, also been pimped in on the hospital. They're like, oh, uh, uh, axillary um, shoulder dislocation, like what, um, what nerve? And I'm like, uh, axillary, yeah. Anything of mid shaft. Radial. Anything in the cubital fossa here is median. So even that can kind of help you figure out. That's so weird. <laughs> I, have like ra I have radial damage and it's like in the middle of my arm. It's so annoying. <laughs> okay, so let's do another uh, question. Share another one with me. Cool. So what else do I have? And, and again, this is what I do with anatomy stuff because like going through the lectures is kind of pointless to some degree. This is not how I would approach um, a biochem lecture or a nutrition lecture or path lecture. This is just for anatomy. Okay. So just when you would do those, I mean, I, I know it's something completely different and it doesn't really apply right now, but you would pay more attention to slides. Yeah. Okay. Because like they're, it just anatomy is hard to learn from slides. It's not how you're supposed to learn anatomy. You're supposed to have a cadaver. You're supposed to have something tangible. So questions mm -hmm. is kind of, the only way in my opinion to learn okay perfect. let's do one more question and then let's look at your histo lecture that you sent us okay perfect um uh, you gave do... me 58 i think you want to do that one yeah yeah let's do it um a 22 year old male football player suffered a wrist injury while falling with force on his outstretched hand um when the atomic or yeah an atomic snuff box is exposed in surgery um, which artery is visualized crossing the fractured bone that provides a floor of this space for this okay. space? So is this question asking you about somebody who damaged something or is it more just an O word surgery and looking at something? It's kind of just a first order determining where it is. Exactly. Now, what we want to do and look at this question is we still want to do those three things, but they're not giving them to us. So the first okay. thing is what is hurt? Wrist. So the first thing, wrist, yeah. And they f fall on outstretched hand, which is called a foosh. Fall yeah. on outstretched hand. Um, and the anatomical snuff box is what we're talking about. Okay. And then they're asking us about a blood vessel that's there. So this is kind of like a do you know or do you not? So mm -hmm. what do you know which artery supplies the anatomical snuff box? You can 100% say no. <laughs> no. Okay, that's I did totally it at fine. 7 a.m., but not anymore. <laughs> Perfect. So go to 449, which is the wrist section of first aid. Okay. And we're going to read about the wrist. 
So the first thing is a mnemonic for how to know all the bones of the wrist, which you need to know, but not really important for clinical. There's only two clinically important bones, and we're going to talk about those. The first is the scaphoid. So read to me what it says about the scaphoid. Um, scaphoid, uh, palpable and atomic snuff box, is the most commonly fractured carpal bone, typically due to a fall in the outstretched hand. Complications of the <laughs> or, yeah, push. Um, complications of proximal scaphoid fractures include avascular necrosis and non-union due to the retrograde blood, supp blood supply from a branch of the radial artery. And I've gotten this wrong on Anki maybe a hundred times. Um, fracture not always seen on uh, initial x-ray. Okay, so when it comes to the wrist, the most important bone is the scaphoid. Why? Okay. Because it has a major blood vessel in that damage. It's the most commonly fractured. And because of this retrograde blood flow, the radial nerve can not supply it, and then you can get avascular necrosis, which means the bone will die and will not heal. Okay. So another thing is, what is the, what is the blood vessel that you're usually taking the pulse for? It's the radial. It's the okay, radial. Okay. Sorry. Nerve. No, no, it's fine. Okay. Like you, you're, you're brand new at this. So the radial nerve is the one near your thumb that you're feeling when you're taking somebody's pulse. Okay. Okay. And the thumb is on that same side, right? And mm -hmm. we already learned that the radial nerve did the thumb side. We actually learned that it did the posterior of the thumb. So guess what blood vessel does the posterior of the thumb, which is the scaphoid. The, ra the radial. Sca the radial. The radial. So the answer is radial nerve because. It always, radial always does the thumb back stuff. Oh, okay, because okay, that picture on 447 has uh, the hand. Exactly. So the blood flow doesn't always match the nerves, but they'll teach you any exceptions. The blood flow should match the nerves. That's why we name things the same. Okay. Okay, and so what you need to know is if they're talking about a fractured hand bone, wrist bone, it's the scaphoid. If they're talking about the blood supply for it, it's the radial nerve. If they're talking about a complication, it's avascular necrosis. Okay, that's so, okay. It's now, just so, there's, that's crazy, but okay. The, there's one tiny sentence after that on 449, which talks about the only other important wrist bone. So I don't want you to memorize all 10 of those wrist bones. I want you to know scaphoid, and I want you to know this one. So what's the next one to talk about? Uh, lunate. Um, right. Dislocations of lunate may cause acute carpal tunnel syndrome. So the lunate doesn't fracture, it dislocates, and it doesn't cause avascular necrosis, it causes carpal tunnel syndrome. That's what you need to know about the wrist bones. Okay. And you'll have questions about both of those, but you're not going to have a question about the trape trapezoid or the capacitate, but those will be the answer choices. So when you know that these two are the most important, that these are two are the only ones mentioned in first aid, you are going to be much more confident with those questions. So you're kind of using first aid as a filter. To know and if something's then, important or not. Okay, because the slides, I mean, I feel like 30, 40% of it is just mass that just needs to be trimmed, you know? Right, now on a uh, practical, they could just point to one of these and say, what is it? And that's fair game. So you need to learn the anatomy for that. But no one on a written exam is going to ask you about the triquetrum or it's not important. So it's not going to be like a picture of an arm and says, what is this? Highly, highly, highly unlikely. The only reason they would do that if they said, a 14 year old was riding his bike, fell on outstretched hand, damaged his scaphoid or damaged a bone. Then they pointed to the scaphoid on the picture and said, what bone did he damage? And it's going to be scaphoid, okay. but you already know that when you fall on outstretched hand, the only wrist bone that you damage is the scaphoid. So they're probably pointing to Okay. So then with regards to your study schedule, um, so you would do this first. And then would you would just kind watch of... the lecture once and then I would jump right into this stuff. Okay. Th that's crazy. I love <laughs> it though. But hopefully, and as you see, how many pages here are there on the arm and wrist? One, two, three, four, five, six, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. But that what that means is all of those lectures come down to these six pages. So at least get these six pages down. If you want to boost that, you can go back into the lectures and get more details. 
but oh, this what is you want to make pass. this is this is the passing stuff and when you want to do better than that you can really dive into the lectures more but this is the basics this is the foundation that you need before you go to a higher level question and then in terms of your your time management on average you'd probably be doing five hours four or five hours I would say however many, Outside. so like I would do an hour for the, on the lecture itself and then like two hours on questions for it. Normally, the MSK again is really, really heavy question based. So whatever okay. you can push with that. And when you finish those Grey's Anatomy ones, there's other books, there's other programs, there's BRS Anatomy questions and you'll do those and you'll have another one about fallen outstretched hand. And hopefully this time you'll get that it's radial artery. And so you're saying just do two million questions, understand million them. Questions. Okay. Oh. But it doesn't this mean just like do thing. them and memorize them. It's mm -hmm. do them to learn the information. I'm looking at pictures of the brachial plexus. I'm looking at pictures of the nerve. I'm looking at where it runs. I'm understanding that it's posterior compartment and that that's what's going to be affected. Like I'm not just like memorize the radial nerve. That's great, but like that doesn't stick. So you have to kind of put all those layers in. I think that's what I did like with FTM too. I kind of just, <clears throat> pardon, I just kind of just memorized the, um, all the questions, like the question and answer like down to the T and then I saw it on the exam. I was like, oh shit. <laughs> so now let's look at that. If you, if you still have time, let's look at that lecture you sent me. Of course. Um, we'll at least skim one, it. Which one was it, 13? I don't have any idea, but I think I opened it. Oh uh, yes, 13. Oh, three. Cartilage. You sent me cartilage. I sent you cartilage. And you can change it if you'd like to do a different one. MSK3. This is, I'm um, sharing it with you. This is the one you sent me. Okay, yeah, let's do this one. I. So I this one's a little bit harder because it's histo, and there mm -hmm. is no histo section in first aid. Histo is relatively mm -hmm. low yield, but it's a foundational thing, right? So we can't use first aid as much for this, but we'll still go through it. Okay. Okay, so percentages. Important, not important. What do you think? Do you have you you've taken two exams now? Have you ever seen a question where it's like no. what percent of something? No. No. Nope. And you spend like 10 minutes memorizing it because you think it's relevant. Right. Now functions. Have you seen questions about functions of things? Yes. Yes. Um, so I'm gonna read this whole slide. I'm going to see that, okay, cartilage is made of extracellular matrix, okay? It's connective tissue. It's made of chondrocytes, chondroblastomas, and chondroclasts. Okay, so now I'm understanding that chondro means cartilage. Mm -hmm. I'm going to see that a big component of it is these gags, which they talk a lot about, and they hold a lot of water. But here's the function. Shape, flexibility, elasticity. That makes sense. Shock absorber. Okay, it's on all my joints, so it makes sense. It's like my knees, people talk about their cartilage on their knees rubbing together. Tensile strength and a model for long bone formation. So I would assume that a lot of lay people could figure out these first three, but most people don't know this last one, a model for long bone formation. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really going to write any of those down unless one of them surprises me like model for long bone formation. I might write that down because I think I already knew that it was a shock absorber. And write it down. Are you, are you using like an iPad or are you using like another So you can just highlight it as you think it's important. You can, what okay. I would do is at the end of this slide, I would have, I forget how to do it now. I would add one blank slide. And I would, as I would go down through these things, anything that I thought was weird or I wouldn't remember, I would just write it, I would scroll down to the bottom and I would write model for long bone formation so that I have it okay. on this slide, right? Okay. okay. So then, because you're looking for things. Okay, so here is this beautiful picture that is often on exams because it's asking you about the layers, okay? Mm -hmm. So it says chondrogenic, genic means new, like genesis, cells give rise to chondroblasts, and blast means babies. So the lowest level gives me a blast. <laughs> Okay. Okay. And this, I'm saying these things because you're going to learn these things in every single cell line. There's okay. blood blasts and there's, there's bone blasts and there's blasts are always baby cells. That's what it means. Um, okay. And genic always means like the first beginning Genesis brand new things. 
Okay. So um, chondroblasts give rise, chondrogenic cells give rise to chondroblasts just below the chondrogenic layer of the perichondrium. So where is that? So here. So what they're like saying right is there. this is where it starts. And all of those words, all they're saying is the earliest cells are right here. This is connective tissue, deep connective tissue. So that's separate. Okay. okay. So the perichondrium is our first layer. It has the baby cell. Mm -hmm. Then chondroblasts are ovoid and positioned so that their longitudinal axis is la Okay, that's uh, just a bunch of nonsense. The direction of cells is not super important to you. Um, mm -hmm. The space occupied by a chondroblast is called a lacuna. So a lacuna is a leak, so these cells kind of have like this lake around them. And then mm -hmm. they synthesize cartilage matrix. So what do I want to know about this slide? I want to know that this beginning part has the genesis and the blasts. Mm -hmm. And then they grow into this level and they start making and synthesizing the cartilage matrix. I'm not memorizing lie parallel to the cartilage. I'm not memorizing this lacuna thing. I'm not memorizing this percent. They pointed out this part in the slide and they said that this has function. And then I'm going to move on and see what happens. Okay, so on that last slide, I would probably write the perichondrium is the layer after deep connective tissue that has the blasts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we have chondrocytes. So if the blasts for the babies, it's the sites are the mature ones. Okay, so they are matured chondroblasts. So now at that last page, I'm gonna write, all right, I think I get this. It's the genesis to the blasts to the site. Right, that's that pathway that I'm kind of trying to memorize and seems simple, but I don't need to know everything about them if I can remember that's the order. Right? Are some of the order questions like? <laughs> sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, they don't usually ask you to like list out all of them, but it's more of an understanding. Like, okay, if they're gonna ask me a lot about chondrocytes, I should probably know. Okay. Okay, so then, so these chondrocytes are matured. So I don't need to memorize that they're the matured ones if I just know that they're the last ones on that list. They're also um, surrounded by matrix. That makes sense because we said matrix making matrix was their job. So babies aren't going to make the matrix. The adults are going to make the matrix. Mm -hmm. It's located deeper and they're more spherical. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Well, we said the, the genesis is were here and the blast started coming here. So, oh, these must be the mature ones and they're actually making, okay, that makes sense, they're deeper. Mm -hmm. um, they divided by mitosis to form groups of four to eight chondrocytes referred to as osseous groups. Huh, this is the first thing they've highlighted. So I'm going to think that that's probably important. Okay, so what I'm going to say is that these sites make matrix and they form isogenous nests of four to eight cells, okay? So it's that same thing that I'm writing at the end of the sheet where I'm like, okay, these are the two things the sites do. So you're making it more dynamic with like arrows and stuff. You're not taking like basic notes. I don't, I don't need to know every word of this. I need to understand every word of it. Okay. Okay. Oh no, now we have a new cell. So what is a chondroclast? So then, so then you would just say originate from monocytes. So then you would think about like where that comes from. Right. So what is a monocyte? Have you guys talked about those yet? Um, I'm pretty sure we have. <laughs> okay. So it's a blood Maybe. cell. It's a macrophage. They eat things. So if a chondroclast arises from a macrophage, something that eats things, what do you think a chondroclast does? Degrades. It degrades things. So clasts always eat and degrade things. Okay. Okay. And oh, look, that's all they said about it. Now we're back to chondros chondrocytes. And what did we say that chondrocytes did? Produce matrix. And what did we say they formed? Isogenic, isogenic groups. Okay. Does this tell me anything more about these isogenic groups that I should know? I mean, just structurally, the type 5 collagen. Right. And I just kind of starting to look at these pictures. Oh, I do kind of see these isogenic groups. Like here's two of them, here's four of them. They do kind of like 
they group together and then they have a lot of matrix and then they group together and they have a lot of matrix, right? Mm -hmm. okay. And I might just look in here and see like, oh yeah, I remember rough ER and lipids and things. That's good to remember. <laughs> okay, moving on. Oh wow, look at this zoomed in now. Okay, so this cell looks like every other cell zoomed in. So mm -hmm. let's see what it mentions. It has irregular surfaces, so it's kind of bumpity. Extensive Golgi. Well, Golgi was part of packaging when we make things, and we said the whole purpose of this was to make things, right? This is a, a producer. Same thing with rough ER. What does rough ER make? Protein. So that makes sense too. Euchromatin, if you remember the difference between heterochromatin and euchromatin, euchromatin was the one that was expressed. It means mm -hmm. it was working hard. We weren't dormant, we're producing things. So these three things aren't special about cartilage. They're special about any cell that makes a lot of things. But this one makes a lot of things. So under wearable matrix, I might put um, lots of Golgi and ER. Just to remind myself that, oh, if we're making matrix, we're going to have lots of Golgi and ER, or rough ER. OK. OK, so now I'm nine slides in, and I have two or three long sentences written. I have the genesis to the blast to the sites. The site's function is to make matrix, matrix which means they mean lots of Golgi and rough ER. And they form isogenous nests of four to eight cells. And the monocytes make the class. Okay. And now that we're on slide nine, I've read that to you six times. So I've reviewed those six high yield things six Anything times by the time we're here. <laughs> and I know that it's, I'm making it seem like super simple and it's not this simple by yourself. You're not going to be good yeah. at this. But you're going to get good at this. I sucked at this term one. I sucked at it term two. I got better and better at every term. Okay. <laughs> as long as there's hope that's all there I is can... hope and this is what you need okay. to practice okay so now i see percentages again am i going to memorize this thing no it's a waste of time no but for whatever reason they drew a blue circle around this one so let me see oh that's type two let me see what they say about that let's read the whole thing so 95 percent of cartilage volume is this extracellular matrix okay we've been talking about the matrix We've just been calling it matrix. Maybe I should write extracellular above it to remind me that it's extracellular matrix. Mm -hmm. So you're going to add that to the map? Going to add that to my okay. map or my whiteboard or my sentences, however structure you want to do it. Now mm -hmm. we're talking about the types of collagen. So collagen is about 15%. Okay, I don't care. Type 2 being the <laughs> most abundant. I do care about that. Why do I care about that? It's bolded. It's circled. And it seems important. Also, have you learned of any diseases about collagen? Yeah, we talked about collagen synthesis being super, super important. And I made everybody watch the, the picture eyes for collagen synthesis. And there's a bunch of diseases, Ehlers-Danlos, osteogenesis imperfecta. There's a lot that goes on with collagen. So it makes sense that they would want to know what type. Mm -hmm. Elastic fibers in type 1 are also present. Okay, depending on the type though. So that's not memorizable. So what type of collagen is my, in my extracellular matrix? Type two. Type two. Plus others. Okay. It is not readily discernible in histological sections because some of the fibrils are very fine. Okay, so they're telling me I can't see it. That's not mm. memorizable. <laughs> okay, more stuff that's in the matrix. Again, they only highlighted one thing. So they're talking about gags. So what does it say about, what does it say here? Um, sulf sulfated groups present in gags make it hydrophilic, enabling for easy diffusion of nutrition um, to the cells. Also provides resilience. And then do you want the next part? <laughs> sure, go ahead. Okay, um, presence of proteoglycans um, provide immense strength uh, to the matrix so that cartilage can function as a model for bone formation. Okay, so did you guys already have your lecture on gags? I'm pretty sure we did. Okay, so there's a Trotz lecture that's just about gags. And she talks yeah, yeah. about how it's sulfatized and how gags love water. And she goes through all the different types. It's very important. But for here, we just want to remind ourselves of those things. Okay. okay. So gags, here they are in the picture. We can see that they're these little like things right here, these little monomers that absorb water like a sponge. And they're in our matrix. Mm -hmm. 
oh, and we skipped ahead or we skipped back. No, I just went to the next slide. So here's the same picture again. Okay, so again, what was this layer called or kind of sounded like or could pick out of a book? Perichondrium. And what, did it, what type of cells did it have in there? Osteoblast. Osteoblast. Osteoblast, yeah, the genesis ones, the blast ones, right? So it becomes like first, like second nature. I mean, it's just like, it's weird how I just like remember that from you, but like I don't remember it from lecture. <laughs> exactly. So now we have these three things that they're talking about, and I think we're kind of labeling them in this lower part. So we already talked about the top part, now we're talking about the lower part more. Mm -hmm. So number one, they say is the capsular matrix, matrix adjacent to the chondrocyte. Oh, okay, so the chondrocyte has a capsule. Okay, that makes sense, I can work with that. Then okay. they talk about this territorial matrix, matrix found around the whole group. So that's that darker circle around the whole group. So each cell has a capsule, and then each group has a matrix. And then there's also matrix between those. So this is time where I would probably just kind of draw this, and mm -hmm. I draw kind of four rough little circles and be like, okay, this one has a capsule, and then this four big group has a, what is it called? A territorial, territorial. matrix. Okay, so really dumb, simple picture, but just telling me what the two things are. And I already I know that it's you. in this last layer because this is the mature layer that we said had the sites and the matrix. Mm -hmm. I'm not even going to show you my notes on this. You're going to die laughing. It's like <laughs> I Harry can tell Potter you that novel. the first time I did this lecture, I rewrote every word of it, and I mean every the and at and circle 10 times, and okay. I still didn't do well on it. <laughs> Oh, and look, now they break this down even more for us. Okay, so let's see. We just learned that the capsule was around each individual one, right? Mm -hmm. So let's see what they say about it. It has a lot of gags. Good to know. So uh, next to capsule, right, gags. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's sulfatized. Well, we already learned that the proteoglycans are sulfatized. Oh, and it's basophilic. So it's blue. Okay, so the capsule is blue. Blue, lots of gags around an individual cell. The interterritorial doesn't really seem important. It just seems like the third one. Mm -hmm. What about the territorial? What does it say about that? What do I need to so add to my list? The, that type 2 collagen fibrils. Oh, well, that makes sense. Type 5 is minimal. Um, and then the lower concentration. Pretty much, honestly, a little bit of everything. Right, so less basophilic. Am I going to remember that this one's less basophilic, or I'm just going to remember that this one is? That one is. Exactly. And what did we already say about type 2 collagen? It was high in all of the matrix. Mm -hmm. So it's not really surprising that the territorial matrix around the cells has a lot of type 2 collagen. I'm still going to write it down, but, you know, that makes sense. The matrix has a lot of type 2. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that in several times in this lecture. Okay, now we're back to this perichondrium, right? We're talking more about this one. So it says, Connective tissue covering entire cartilage except articular surfaces, okay? It's made up of two layers. So this perichondrium actually has two layers. So what are the two layers? So the outer fibrous layer contains fibroblast, um, which synthesizes collagen type 1. Um, and that's where I'd probably make the note like the type 1. Um, and then the intercellular layer, chondrogenic layer, chondrogenic cells. Right. So as a techie person, you might even just take this picture and put it on a slide by itself, and then just like label, oh, outer layer, fibroblasts, mm -hmm. inner layer, chondrocytes. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna, but I don't have anything on the perichondrium in yet, so I'm just gonna write perichondrium, and I'm gonna write outer fibrous, inner genic. Because again, I'm not using that chondro suffix every time because that's confusing. I'm going to use the second part of the word, the genic, the blast, the sites. Okay. So outer is fibrous, fibroblasts, and inner is the genic cells, the cartilage cells. Oh, even more about it. Okay, so does this say anything new? Outer, fibrous. Nope. Fibrous is going to have fibroblasts. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. They did mention the type 1 collagen again, so I guess I'll write it down because they mentioned it twice. Um, it's also the only one with a blood supply. So you don't know this, but cartilage does not have a blood supply. It gets it from this outer layer. So I'm going to make that a big deal. 
Okay. okay. The inner cell was, we just said it was chondrocytes, so that's fine. So this is the blue part. This is the important part that they're telling you to read that. Okay. So cartilage is avascular. Um, nutrients are supplied by vessels from perichondrium by diffusion or from the syn synovial fluid at the articular surfaces. Right. So where does, how is, what is the only reason that cartilage can survive is because the blood flow in this perichondrium. So then so we would important. put perich, okay. Okay. And I'm going to type this, I'm going to type up a sample sheet for this at the end. Okay. And I'll send it to you so that you can kind of see how I formatted it in the end. Okay. Also see how much time I'm taking on this. Granted, I know this stuff, but I am not wasting my time trying to understand it all. I'm getting a framework no. and then I can work from that. So you would be doing like, like a post, it's kind of like a post read, right? Because you wouldn't be using, so you be spending like 50, 60 minutes maybe? So I would, I would watch the lecture on double spine at time speed, 30 minutes, trying to understand it. And then I'd spend another half an hour going through it, making a good framework. Okay. Because I find that if done. I try and make a framework before I've seen the whole thing, I get mixed up. But if I've seen the whole thing and I kind of understand that, okay, first we do some like layers, then we get into the types. Okay. I can make that work. And that's first pass. That's not, that's, that's going to lecture. You're watching it. Boom. Right. My okay. second pass, I'm making a framework, and then I'm not looking at it again until the weekend. Wow. Okay. And you've already or kind of memorized it. Or you look it. at that framework over and over again. But okay. I'm going to try and do questions and stuff on it. So now I know that there's three types. Hyaline, elastic, and fibrocartilage. Don't know mm -hmm. anything about them. I'm just looking at these pictures. It seems like it's important to be able to recognize them because they gave me a cartoon. All right. So what do I see? Well, this one has straight lines. That seems interesting. Okay. This one and this one both look pretty similar, but this one has a lot more cells and this one has a lot more matrix. This one's also okay. a lot more blue. Don't know if that'll be important or not, but I'm just kind of getting a quick look at it. I'm assuming they're going to go through each type. Yes. Okay. So hyaline cartilage, where do we have it? Our nose, our trachea, our larynx, um, long bones, growth plates, and fetal skeleton. Okay. Unfortunately, these are all probably memorizable. I'd probably write these all down. Okay. Hyaline cartilage. Okay. Well, chondroblasts and chondrocytes. That makes sense because what makes car all cartilage? Chondro chondrocytes. Chondrocytes, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, chondroblasts yeah. that make chondrocytes. And oh, look, it makes extracellular matrix. Oh, and look, it has type, type two, 2 and lots of gags like all of the matrix. <laughs> okay, so that is true of everything we've learned so far. So am I gonna write that down again? No, no. I already have it written down. Okay, these things though, I haven't heard anything about appositional and interstitial growth. It doesn't degenerate, okay, and it can calcify. So what I'm gonna write under hyaline, besides all of the things that it does in the slide before it, is that mm -hmm. it does appositional, which I don't even know what that means. I'll look it up later. And interstitial growth. And it can calcify, which is important because this is what makes our bones. So it starts out as cartilage in the fetal skeleton right here. And then it calcifies and becomes bone. So these bones in this baby, you can see the parts that are uncalcified and calcified. It's transitioning over to bone. Mm -hmm. um, do, 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 do. more okay supportive cushioning shock absorbing is that different from the first list that we saw on the first page same thing same thing I'm not gonna write it down histo glassy appearance because fibers and ground substance has the same I mean do you see glassy I don't know I'm gonna remember that this one know. just has a lot of matrix mm. Oh, look, ECM correlates to collagen and sulfatated groups. What are the sulfatated Purity. groups? The gag. The gags, or, you yeah. know that okay. now. And what type of collagen do you think it is? Type two. Type two. Okay. Oh, and look, now they're going to explain oppositional growth and interstitial growth. So then you're going to go back in that little thing and... And add that to it. And I won't go through the rest of the lecture. You, you get the idea. That's crazy. I like... And I then, oh, look, like they have questions at the end. So can I answer these questions at the end? And then I'm going to look at that list over and over again. And that gives me more time to do 90 Anki questions and stuff like that. True. 
So with the, um, like with the anatomy lectures, they have all these tables at the end, like fill in this table, fill in this table, fill in the table. It's up to you. I mean, like first aid okay. already has the table, so like you could do it. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of how you learn. If you learn really well from charts, absolutely fill it in. Fill it in while you do the question. You know, like you could now go into the radial section and answer some of those radial things. You can be like, I feel confident about the radial nerve now. You can go now watch a YouTube video on the radial nerve. Like, you know what, I'm just gonna, you know what, I had like three questions in a row about the radial nerve. I'm just gonna go watch a YouTube video about it, make sure I really understand it, and then go keep doing questions. Okay. Oh, it's so <laughs> frustrating. It's like honestly frustrating. Like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but so we, we quickly went through that lecture and I mean, I only have, couple sentences written down in this jumbled thing. I would be typing it because this is a mess or writing it down on paper. And then you can review that paper at the end of the day or every day. You can read a couple pages on Histo every day. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as far as like on the weekend, then you would kind of look at the slides again? Yeah. Or... So I would go through them again because at that point, if I'm looking at, if I have one sheet per page, I mean, for, le for lecture that I'm looking at every night, then by the time I, the weekend comes around and I reread that lecture, I can be like, yep, that's on my list, that's on my list, that's, oh, I didn't notice that. I should add that to my list. And now mm -hmm. you're comparing it to what you know instead of just seeing a whole jumbled bit of the stuff you still don't know. Okay. And you and can add layers your, to your knowledge. On your exam prep, you have, I've noticed you don't have a lot of um, time leading up to the exam. Like you start at like Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Like, week one, Friday, week two, Saturday. So that's kind of, you're looking at your condensed notes and then. Because I'm kind of, assuming in that set that you are looking at these condensed notes every day. And then, so then okay. when it comes, or you're doing the Anki every day, or you're doing something that helps you review everything every day, whether that's at the weekends where I'm like, oh, do you have these lectures, have these lectures. By the time you get to those, that ending part, in theory, you should already be very comfortable. Okay. It's not like wait till that last week to review week one. It's like, I assume you already know week one and now you're just like reviewing. Just opening it up, seeing it, okay. Yeah. And is it still enough questions. time, do I still have enough time to catch up? Yeah, always. <laughs> okay. Always. Oh, okay.